Hi everyone, this is Bob, the old ham. Been on the air, I believe, 63 years now. And uh, really like uh, building and uh, repairing uh, equipment. I'm not able to do much anymore at age 79. I did this uh, project, I started it in uh, 2017. Uh, it's a KW amplifier. And uh, I built it in a microwave oven cabinet. The cabinet is a 1983 Sharp microwave oven. I bought it at the Goodwill store. And I saw it there and it was marked $12. I had no idea what I was going to build this amplifier in. All I knew was that I was going to use these high power transistors. There's one right in there. I think you can see it. Yeah. 2SD2933s. I got four of them in a little plastic box here. And uh, I bought four of those and decided to experiment with them. I was really fascinated with the idea of transistors running a thousand watts. Those transistors are power MOSFETs and they're rated for 300 watts each. And there's four of them in the amp. I normally run the amp at about 500 watts. And uh, so this is the cabinet. This is the original uh, plastic bezel that went around the outside. I took everything out of the cabinet, took the bezel off, and, uh, and used the, the cabinet. <laughs> like I say, it cost me $6. Uh, after I put it in the grocery cart and it, took it to the checkout, the lady said, are you a senior? I said, yeah. She says, it's a half a day, half price, excuse me, half price for seniors today. So the $12 microwave cost me $6. This shows the uh, aluminum bezel that I made to go around the outside. I put a piece of aluminum sheet in there after I had painted it with uh, gray paint. I used Krylon industrial gray paint for that. And uh, came out really nice. Uh, there's another shot. There's a shot of the bezel itself made out of uh, one inch aluminum angle which I bought at uh, one of the big, big box uh, hardware stores. And this shows how the corners are put together. That's a small piece of uh, old circuit board in there. And uh, you can see I've got those marked there with a uh, marking pen. So I can put them together. And I used very small hardware actually. Uh, this is 632 hardware with uh, self-locking nuts. And uh, this was quite a project. It took me quite a while. There is the uh, aluminum front panel. Uh, that I painted gray mounted in there. The top of it is mounted with just four screws, two on each side at the bottom. I can take those off and slide the top off. But the only thing that gets you to is the wiring that goes from one part to the other. I did not want to take this all apart for the video here. Uh, that's just going too far. I'm afraid I'm going to damage something. So I decided I would leave it together and show you how these things can be done and uh, show you the pictures. This is the circuit board I bought for the amplifier and uh, I don't know exactly who made this circuit board. I'm thinking RM of uh, Italy. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't recall exactly who the guy was I bought it from. I go to these ham fests and things and I pick up stuff. You notice there is a 723 uh, regulator chip right there and uh, that has caused some problems uh, in that it tends to drift a little bit and the biasing on the uh, on the amplifier will change a little bit so uh, uh, I uh, put a second regulator ahead of that which was a uh, which was an LM 7808 ahead ahead of the 723 and that stabilized things quite a bit although it still seems to drift a little bit uh, bias is very critical on these. If it goes up and down, it changes quite a bit through those transistors. So uh, you want that to be right. This is the output filtering circuit board. It is what they call a diplexer board. You will see here, this is the main RF circuits. And these are the relays here and here that switch in to turn on those different filters. See, this is a filter, six meter filter up here. And down here we've got the uh, 160 meter filter. 
These are the same thing, little filters, and they are switched in by these relays and feed this resistor bank here. Now these resistor bank, the whole thing I think is 1200 ohm resistors, and there's, uh, 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 I forget how many, 24 of them in parallel, and they're 2 watts each, so you got 48 watts of resistors there, and what that does is when you're operating, let's say on 80 meters, then if you have a second harmonic, these are tuned to the second harmonic and above, and they dump that energy, that unwanted energy, into all these resistors. So this is a much better low-pass filter filtering system, diplexer system, than just the regular low-pass filter. And uh, I did have a problem with this. I uh, switched the rig to uh, 40 meters. I transmitted into the amp on 40 meters. I was on a dummy load at the time, checking it out. And uh, then I smelled a lot of smoke and uh, found out that uh, I had the amp still set on 80 meter coils here. And then since it went to the uh, diplexer, the diplexer took the uh, second harmonic, which is 40 meters, and dumped it all into these resistors. I fried the whole bunch. And what I did to repair that, that big goof was I, uh, I cut the resistors out of the circuit. They're still on the board, but I uh, disconnected them from the circuit and connected a piece of coax which goes to the back panel of the amplifier. It's got an SO239 connector, and all of this diplexer energy now dumps into a one kilowatt uh, bird dummy load. So no problem with it getting overloaded again. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, that was a problem. I did have automatic switching on here with an LM3914 uh, uh, IC. Uh, the, I, the ICOM 7300 would then switch the bands automatically, and I had trouble with that. I tried everything I could think of. I tried two or three different circuit boards. I tried different ICs. I changed all the transistors on the, on the switching board. I went round and round and round with that automatic switching. So what I've done is I've got everything now operated by this band switch. And I switch it manually. Like that. So I wanted to show you that. And uh, this is the amplifier here, by the way. And I've got it hooked up in CW. It should... Uh, it should transmit here. This will show power output. This will show SWR. It's all running into a big dummy load, which is located over there underneath the operating bench down and back. <laughs> so uh, we've got a nice big dummy load on it there. This shows the voltage of the uh, power supply. The power supply is two telephone type power supplies they used uh, at telephone systems to supply 48 volts to the phone system. These are rated at 20 amps each and they're running in parallel. They're designed to work that way. So we've got uh, 40 amp capability there. This shows the current. I've got a test, a test button here. Here's the test button. I push the test button and it'll show me the idling current of the output transistors which right now is right on the money. That's where it should be. Well, 2 amps, 2.1, darn close. So that shows the idling current of the power MOSFET output transistors. And I put that on there because it was drifting around and I wanted to check it. So I put that on so I can check it anytime I want without running any RF through it. Now I've got it hooked up on CW on 80 meters. So uh, I'll do a transmission here. Try to get it around so that you can see better. There we go. 518 watts. And there it shows on the Heathkit HM2140 SWR bridge watt meter. Now, this Heathkit HM2140 gave me troubles too. And I cured that by putting a 9 volt power pack on. One of those wall warts, a lot of guys call it 
put that on there. I haven't had any trouble with it since. But when I tried to run it with 9 volt batteries, it was not stable. It'd be okay for a couple of days and then it would start to drift and I'd have to realign it and fiddle around with it. Now it stays put. So if you've got one of these, try it with a wall wart type power pack, a little black type power pack that plugs in the wall. And uh, what else can I tell you about this right now? This is the temperature of the uh, final heat sink. Believe it or not, 69 degrees right now. The hottest I've seen it is 83 degrees. The heat sink is very, very large. Okay, so I have run this thing now since 19... Uh, 19. Wow, boy, am I in an antique uh, time here. I've run it since 2017. 5, 10, 2017 without any problems. But I did have like about six months of problems with it before I got it working properly. This is the circuit board with all the parts mounted on it. You can see it's mounted on a one quarter inch thick copper plate. This is not this is not that thick. This is another piece here in the back. But this plate that it's mounted on, this is quarter inch thick here. And this is all mounted on the heat sink. So, and there's another shot of the amplifier itself. The power comes in through that little transformer right there and goes out through that big transformer on the back. And you can see I made a lot of notes in there. Uh, these are threaded for 832 down below and things like that to help me with uh, assembly. By the way, if you make marks like that on something you're building and you want to take them off, just take some alcohol on a little rag and you can wipe off a permanent marker with alcohol. Very easy. Another shot of the amplifier. This is the big heat sink. You can see how large that thing is. And this is on the back of the cabinet now. And another shot of the power amplifier. I don't know why they have to have those resistors up so high, but they do. You'll notice that these, uh, these are supposed to be connected to ground here on the sides of the transistors. Uh, that's the source on those, but those also connect internally directly to the mountings, the mounting bolts, which are not in there right now. So those don't need to be connected to something here. And I had to uh, clip that one off so that I could get that uh, uh, heat sensor thermistor located right over the top of that transistor there for the biasing. That's a 240 volt converter transformer. I was running on 120 volts to check circuits out. And there shows you the uh, quarter inch thick uh, mounting plates or heat spreaders. And those were from some other commercial transmitter I bought just to get that part. And there's the heat sink down below. And this is the workbench where I put everything together. Rather cluttered. I, I, I usually have a cluttered workbench and a cluttered shop and uh, you know somebody who's really neat and clean and organized with everything never has the joy of finding something that they thought was lost forever and so problems that I've had with it uh, was with the 723 uh, 723 voltage regulator drifting and uh, let's see what I got here Oh, chip capacitors. Oh my golly. Chip capacitors. Where are they at here? Right, there's one right down in there. I don't know if you can see the arrow, but these chip caps, there's one right there. There's another one right behind this part of the transformer. At these right behind that, so you can't see it. Those things blew. About the third or fourth time I ran some power through this amplifier and got it up pretty high, those just popped. 
and I have replaced them, believe it or not, with standard disk capacitors, and I have four standard 0 0.05 disk capacitors at 1000 volts. They're all laying on top of each other right in here because those don't need to be chip caps. They can be bigger caps and solder them right down and that cured the problem with those chip caps popping. They would just go pop and uh, come apart. So this amplifier is very very rugged when those popped it takes the load completely off of the output transistors and uh, I thought it might do damage. It did not. I have run the amplifier I'd say three or four times without anything connected to it and I have also run it with a short circuit connected to it uh, when I goofed up and so I'm not a perfect uh, not a perfect guy from a long way uh, by a long shot so anyhow but I'm very very pleased with these rugged rugged transistors that did not go out and I'm grateful for that so what else we got here uh, okay oh there's a the the, uh, the one circuit I saw on this they used what they call a high side switch it's an integrated circuit supposed to switch 30 amps no problem uh, I put three of them in and blew them all three out so I put a great big res a great big relay in there four bay relay connected all four bays rated 10 watts 10 watts 10 amps a bay uh, 10 amps each and I put them all four in parallel and I haven't had a bit of trouble with the relay and uh, What else? Oh, and I did one other thing because when I when I turned this thing on to 40 meters I had it on 80 and that second harmonic of the filter which is 40 meters then was all dumped into those resistors so uh, to avoid that again I put a horn in there I put a diode in there that detects the voltage on the resistors which is now connected to the dummy load down below but anyhow on 80 meters if you transmit on 40 the horn will go off so here we'll do that I got my my uh, 3d key down here And that's what happens when I put it on the wrong band and if the RF goes up real high on those uh, on that resistor network which is now a dummy load externally now so anyways I just wanted to show you guys what could be done what I did it is not a construction project it is a how should I put it it's a show-and-tell guys it's a show-and-tell so uh, that's it I uh, I'm glad I saved these pictures for God's sakes uh, so that I can get on here and and show you guys what's inside the box so that's it uh, everybody out there uh, it's a great great time for amateur radio I think with this COVID-19 and all I can come down into the basement and talk to my friends all over the territory and I really enjoy that. If you haven't checked out amateur radio, check it out. Go to a club meeting. Find out if there's an amateur radio club nearby. I'll bet there is. And just go to the club meeting and say, Hi, I'm interested in amateur radio. Most of them have got uh, courses you can take to get your license. It's not hard to get a license. It's not difficult like it was years ago. No Morse code is required. And they have people that will uh, tutor you and, and some classes or some clubs even have a, a course you can take and get your license in one day. So I just like to encourage you to do that. It's a wonderful hobby that you can do, especially when you're like 79 years old like me. You can still do it. That's it, everybody. 73s and good DX.